There's a very, very famous question that is asked about the Hanukkah story. It's one of the most famous questions in halachic literature. We know that we celebrate the holiday of Hanukkah for eight days because when the Jews regained the temple after the Greeks had conquered it and taken possession of it, so they were looking for oil and they found only one jar of pure oil that burnt for one day. And miraculously, it burnt for eight days and therefore we celebrate the holiday of Hanukkah for eight days. The question is, given the fact that there was enough oil to burn for one day, the miracle of Hanukkah is simply the extra seven days. If that is the case, Hanukkah ought to be a seven-day holiday rather than an eight-day. Why do we celebrate Hanukkah for eight days? This, as I say, is one of the most famous questions in halachic literature. There are at least 500 answers to this question because, in fact, I have a sefer that has 500 answers. Uh, time will not allow 500 answers. But I just want to give you one answer that I think could be very, very relevant to the life that we live and the predicaments that we face in the 21st century as we are looking towards the Mashiach. The Jewish people were fighting the Yavanim. One has to recognize that our struggle against the Greeks was not for political or materialistic reasons. In fact, the Greeks were relatively benign. The Greeks were willing to give the Jewish people full civil and political rights, economic privileges, as long as we would give up our uniqueness, as long as we would assimilate, as long as we would participate in Greek culture and Greek religion, we would be treated with all equality given to all citizens. The fight of Hanukkah was not one of politics. The fight of Hanukkah was to establish the primacy of Torah, to establish the unique role of the Jewish people, to fight against assimilation and intermarriage and violation of the Torah. It was a religious struggle that needed to be military simply because if we would not follow uh, the Greek religion, if we would not abandon the Torah, the Greeks would destroy us physically. But there was no need for a physical struggle had we agreed to the assimilation. The Jewish people, many of them went along with this plan. We don't realize that the enemies of, against the Hasmonean struggle were not simply the Greeks. Many, many Jews, and perhaps a majority of the Jews, we're basically saying to the fanatical Hasmoneans, why are you so old-fashioned? Why don't you go with the plan? Why don't you adopt yourself to the new realities of society? Become a citizen of the world and a Jew in your home, to paraphrase something that was said in the 19th century. And that small fanatical group, and I put fanatical, of course, in quotation marks, who basically said, we are not going to compromise. We are going to stand for the Torah. We are going to assert the uniqueness of the covenants that God has with the Jewish people. In many, many ways, their whole effort would seem to be fruitless. It would seem to be foolish. What is the sense? What are you going to accomplish? You have overwhelming odds against the greatest military and political powers in the world. You don't have the support of your own people. What is the use of trying to struggle? 
if you're struggling against overwhelming odds in which you have absolutely no chance to be successful. But the Chashmonayim persevered. The Chashmonayim said, no matter what the odds, we will do what we are able to do. We will persevere even if it looks as if we will certainly fail. And then we will leave it to God to bless our efforts with success. And thus, the concept is reflected in microcosm, in the looking of the oil. Without getting into the technicalities, according to the halacha, if all you have is impure oil, you are permitted to use it for the lighting of the temple. Why did they bother to look for pure oil? What did that represent? And that represents the idea that when you are given a choice between purity and impurity, you do what you can even if that choice seems hopeless, fruitless, and devoid of any potential for victory. So the miracle of the first day of Hanukkah was not that the oil burnt, but that they bothered to look for it in the first place. They could have thrown in the towel. They could have said, what's the point? They could have said, what's the use? But their determination was, what we can do, we will do. What we're able to accomplish, we must have a responsibility to accomplish. And in effect, the whole idea of the miracle of Hanukkah shows this. They light the oil for one day. But what is the use of lighting oil for one day if the next day it's not going to last? Why even bother to dispel the darkness of day one? If day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nothing's going to happen. And yet, what does Hanukkah say? You do what you can. And only, and you, only if you do what you can does God then bless your efforts beyond that which you thought was possible. A little historical note. People often think that the miracle of the oil was the end of the struggle against the Ivanim, against the Greeks. That actually is not true. We captured the temple, and of course, and we dedicated the temple. That, of course, was extremely important. But the war against the Greeks lasted for another 25 years. The miracle of Hanukkah is towards the beginning of the armed struggle, not towards the end. And if you look at it that way, you see something very moving and very powerful. God is assuring a beleaguered people, don't give up, don't lose hope, do what you can, even if the odds seem to be overwhelming, because the little bit of oil that you lit should only have burnt one night, but it burnt for eight days. So too, the struggle against overwhelming odds being opposed by the greatest military and political force in the world, being opposed by the majority of your own people. But if you persevere, God will bless your efforts beyond which you thought was possible. The miracle of the oil was the miracle that gave them reassurance and comfort and resilience and courage to continue that struggle for, as I say, a quarter of century further into the future. There are many types of darknesses in the world. There is the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of despair, the darkness of violence, Islamofascism, nuclear war. And I as a Jew, all of us as a Jew, we get up every morning and we wonder, what possibly can we do to bring light to the world? My few mitzvot, my, few, my little bit of Torah study, how is that going to make a difference? How will that little bit of insignificant light dispel the massive darkness that covers the world, that brings the world to the brink of destruction, physically, psychologically, and spiritually. But the lesson of Hanukkah is that even if from the perspective of the human understanding, your efforts seem puny, insignificant, and meaningless, if you do what you can to dispel that darkness, God will bless your efforts with a success beyond which you thought could have been possible. Hanukkah is the message of the light that dispels the darkness. Every Jew must be a lamplighter. Every Jew must shed that light. May God merit that we discover the light that is within us and that we be able to share that light and dispel the darkness in the world.
Hanukkah is a time when a Jew's thoughts turn to Greece, and not because of the current economic crisis. We're celebrating the victory of the Maccabees over Hellenistic influence that invaded the Jewish people and played a great role in the degradation, the deterioration of Torah observance, Torah belief, Torah values. Our attitude towards Greece is defined by a famous verse in the book of Genesis. Let Yefes, whose descendant is Yavan, Greece, let him grow, let him develop, let him flourish. And let him dwell in the tents of shame, whose descendant is the Jewish people. Greece is wonderful. It's science, it's mathematics, it's philosophy, it's art, architecture. The culture of Greece is wonderful when it dwells in the tents of shame, the tents of Torah, the tents of the Jewish people. When it's a servant of those higher values, then it's wonderful. But as in every case of means and ends, there's a great danger that the means will forget their purpose and take on the false position of being ends. And that leads to tragedy. That leads to disaster. It's a hallmark of democratic societies that the military is under the control of a civilian government. Why? The military are the experts at war. They are the ones who know how to win battles. But they don't necessarily know when it's worthwhile to fight, or how it's appropriate to fight. Those are values that go beyond military expertise. Democracies understand that you can't leave it up to the military to decide when and how to fight. That has to be in the hands of those who appreciate the values for which the entire society stands, not just those who are masters of the means of fighting. There is a perennial debate in academia, in the universities, between the arts and the sciences. The sciences pride themselves in their accomplishments, new technology, new understanding of the universe, and they challenge the arts. Can you explain why the stars shine? How many new apps have you developed for our technology? What do the arts reply? They reply, indeed, you have built marvelous technology, and you have provided us with understanding of how the universe works, to what end, for what purpose, what is the value of that technology, what are we going to do with that understanding of how the world works. That's what the arts are providing. The arts are providing an insight into the purpose of the activity of the sciences, and therefore the arts cannot be ignored. They cannot be simply subjugated to building new apps for your smartphone. But the truth is, it's more than that, because Greece includes both the sciences and the arts. And we are talking about both of them being means to a higher end. Take, for example, medicine. Medicine has made enormous strides in lengthening life and increasing the value of life, the, 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 uh, the quality of life. But medicine cannot determine the purpose of life or the value of life. When medicine strays over into euthanasia, when medicine pretends to determine when life should be terminated, medicine has stepped beyond its appropriate role as means and has pretended to become a representation of the ends. And then it has stepped out of its place. Medicine, too, has to be under the control of the general values of the society. Otherwise, it usurps its role. Economics, mathematical economics, is based on the assumption of the rational consumer. People have things that they value, and they are going to rationally use their means to achieve those ends. Amartya Sen, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, was famous for criticizing this entire effort on the grounds that people are not rational consumers. 
that's not what they are. That does not define their identity or their essence. People are much more. First of all, they make mistakes in rationality, but their being, their value, their purpose transcends being merely rational consumers. And therefore, these models of economics are based on a false picture of the human being. And the response from the mathematical econ economists was, but if we don't make this assumption, we can't prove any theorems. You can figure out for yourself exactly what that's worth. You have to make a false assumption about human beings to prove your theorems. To whom do your theorems apply? And that's why we can't predict what economies will do, because they're based on a false picture of what the human being is. And if you start with an assumption that man is merely a more developed animal, what then of man's hopes, man's dreams, and man's responsibilities? You are nothing but a slightly smarter squirrel. Then you respond to the world like a squirrel, a squirrel with better brains. So can we expect elevated values from a slightly smarter, squ smarter squirrel? Can we ex expect ultimate self-sacrifice? Can we expect a vision for the perfection of the world and mankind? Probably not. And then man's hopes and dreams collapse around him, and he defines himself on a par with the other animals with a specialty in building apps. That's an utterly false picture. A human being is a soul and a body charged with a cosmic purpose of perfecting himself and perfecting the whole creation in the image of the creator. If you don't have that ultimate picture, if you're not confronting that ultimate reality, then you are going to take the means and mistake them for the ends. You're going to allow Greece to get out of control and to allow Greece to define your ends, which is a terrible, terrible failure. It's like letting the military run your government. And we know what the disasters that leads to. This applies especially to philosophy. There are those who call themselves the new atheists, and they try to apply philosophical and pseudo-scientific thinking to understand and debunk religion. If you study their writings, which I don't necessarily recommend, but if you study their writings, you find that in philosophical terms and in scientific terms, they are amateurs. Why? Because they've never studied religion. And they're using their expertise to debunk religion. But they're out of their element. When I taught at Johns Hopkins in the 70s, we had a fellow in the, in the uh, physics department who discovered a new particle. That was the fashion those days. Every Monday or Thursday, they discovered a new particle. More energy, more particles. And he became famous. The student newspaper interviewed him for his views on religion. In the philosophy department, they put it up on the bulletin board with the legend, See how many mistakes you can find in this. It was childish. Why would you go to a physicist and ask him about religion? Would you ask him about macrobiotic cooking? No, you'd say he's a physicist. What does he know about macrobiotics? Well, what does he know about religion? All these books on the basis of these philosophers and, and scientists who criticize religion have no footnotes to first-class religious sources, none, because they've never studied it. They read caricatures in the popular political press, and they address those as if they were attacking religion. And the people who read those books, who themselves also haven't studied religion, think that they have the latest, most scientifically up-to-date refutations of religion. But it simply isn't true. After all, if you want an expert opinion on the comparative merits of two ideas, A and B, who do you go to? Don't you go to someone who's fluent in both A and B? Why would you go to someone who's only fluent in A and, critice, and read a critique of B? And these people are not fluent in both. Sam Harris, who's a neurobiologist, a neurosurgeon, gives his thoughts about consciousness. I speak as a philosopher. They're childish. Any philosopher can see that he doesn't grasp what the problems are. He doesn't grasp what the dynamics are. No philosopher quotes him in their studies of consciousness. It's a joke. But because he's a scientist, he's supposed to be super smart and super intelligent, and he's supposed to have the latest and best views on every subject, including subjects in which he's not trained. This is where the means break out of their appropriate traces and they become ends. And that's a tragedy. What attitude are we supposed to have towards Greece? We extend to Greece the hand of friendship. Friendship as a partner 
in our projects, but a partner on our terms. A partner in providing us with technology, with providing us with some understanding of the world, and where the technology steps over the boundary, or where the expert steps over his boundary and tries to dictate ends, or where the vision of the world steps beyond its boundary and doesn't take into account that there's a creator and a creation and a divine providence running the way the world works, when it steps beyond those bounds, it has gone too far. The hand of friendship to Greece is a hand of friendship for partnership on our terms. It's crucial for us to know what the terms of the Torah are. The more we study it, the better we understand what the ultimate values are, what the ultimate goals are, and what the ultimate vision of the universe is. And then we know exactly how to accept the gifts that Greece can give us. Medrash in Breishis, in the beginning of the Chumash, Talmudic commentary on Genesis, gives a listing of the future exiles that Klai Yisrael will have. And last one that's, uh, that's listed is Edom. And spilling into Edom is the Greek exile, which was here in Eretz Yisrael, which is a reference to the time of the Hashemunayim, of the Hanukkah story. They made an enigmatic statement, the Greeks, and they said, write on the horns of an ox that you have no part in the God of Israel. What does it mean? There are various interpretations been offered over the years, very esoteric statement. One possibility of trying to understand it, that a little over a hundred years before the story of Hanukkah was the Septuagint, that was the Hellenistic king in Egypt, Talmai, brought 70 scholars without telling in advance why they were coming. Last minute, he sprang it on them that they have to translate the Bible, the Torah, written text into Greek. Put in separate cubicles, they had no time to consult, and yet, miraculously, they all came out with the same translations, exact translation, and even with euphemisms in places where it was, had to be politically correct, instead of getting into discussions that are explicated by the, by the Talmud, such as, verse says, we will create man. It means God, but God consults the Talmud teachers with the celestial court. God doesn't have to consult, but it's didactic. It's to teach us that we should consult. Such variations, they skipped the question and answer, and they just went to the singular. And they said, I will create. And there's a listing in the Talmud of where they made their euphemistic divergences. Divergences. Question is that less than a hundred years it took for them to understand the Greeks that they had won a battle that did promote Hellenization. It was miraculous. But now the Greeks could say, you don't have to go to Panovich, Tervedas, Chaim Berlin. You can, you can come to the university in Philadelphia and Alexandria and you can study the text of the Torah. So they won that battle, but they didn't win the war. The Talmud likens it to the lion that was formerly roaming free was now caged. They didn't have the oral law. What they wanted then, when they understood that in order to promote and infiltrate into the psyche, the spirit of the Jew, they have to have access to the oral law, they said, kiss for al write down. 
the oral law, freeze it, and then we will in fact be able to force you to translate that as well. Later, when the time came for it to be written down, when Rabbi Yehuda Nossi decides that it should be written down, that's an internal decision and will be expedited with our criteria and our norms according to the halacha. But had it been done earlier, it in fact would have created that problem. And so Hanukkah is the celebration of our resistance when, they, when it's recorded in al Nisim in the prayer that we recite on Hanukkah that they wanted us to forget our Torah, it means they wanted us to stop our engagement with the oral law in our manner, which is unique, and pass from generation to generation, from Rebbe to Talmud, from each teacher to his disciple. That remains the unique province of the Jewish people, and that's what's celebrated on Hanukkah. So not only did they not win in their battle against this spiritual, intellectual battle against the against the Hashmonoim, the Hasmoneans, but we wind up with a new holiday, which is a fact, purely an expression of the oral law. Because without the mandate of the oral law, there could be no Hanukkah, which is initiated by rabbinic legislation. That's in fact what has been achieved with the Hanukkah. Then we could say the there's a special dimension in Hanukkah called Hido Mitzvah to beautify the mitzvah. That which wicks, which oil you use, each member of the household lighting the candle, the using more than one candle, Hido Mitzvah, beautifying the mitzvah. It's rare that we find that Hido Mitzvah has so been integrated into the norm of the acceptance of the practice of the community as being an integral part. And perhaps we could say that that is in fact the measure for measure, the meter connected meter, that that's the balance, the irony, that our beautifying of Torah is by seeing the levels of the text, the texture of the text, seeing the different plateaus of inference and implication, which can only be accessed through the oral law. That's our beautification of it. And that's why the brother of the Maral says, when we make a party, a seum for the conclusion of studying a tractate, we say, Hadroch Olon, your beauty is on us, God, and our beauty is on you. Says the brother of the Maral in the Sefer Achaim, what does it mean our beauty is on you? Because we carry the oral law and we know that's the only way to access the soul of the text of the written law, which then remains again unique to Am Yisrael. That's the celebration of the lights, that's the celebration of Hanukkah, that's the miracle that has been preserved by Jews throughout the, throughout the millennia. Everybody knows Hanukkah comes around, and when Hanukkah comes around, there's always an association that's made between Hanukkah and light. We know we rekindle the candles, we kindle the candles of Hanukkah, representative of the light. Everybody knows that the source of this idea of rekindling the light is because we were in exile, Golus, was called Galut, and this exile was called the Greek exile, which is alluded to already in the Torah in the very first section of the Torah when it says, V'choshech al home, there was darkness over the abyss, and the Medrash says that that darkness refers to the exile, the Greek exile. Now, we rekindle the light on Hanukkah, and obviously a light is symbolic not only of the physical light of those candles, but obviously of a light of the Jewish people which has been extinguished and the commentaries explain the light of enthusiasm, our enthusiasm for Torah and our enthusiasm for mitzvahs, and that's part of the job, that's what we're trying to do, trying to accomplish on Hanukkah. Very interesting, 
a few years back, maybe more than a few years, about 20 years ago, there's an Israeli reporter writing for one of the, the editor of one of the main secular Israeli newspapers, a man named Amnon Denkner. And Amnon Denkner presented a challenge to the secular Israeli public. It was right around Hanukkah time. And Amnon Denkner challenged the secular Israeli public, and he said to them the following. He said, just imagine the battle is taking place today. So we know Hanukkah is, involves battles, it involves sufganiyot, the jelly-filled donuts that everybody enjoys on Hanukkah. Somebody once said that the jelly-filled donut is a perfect miracle food because you eat one and it burns inside for eight days. The perfect miracle <laughs> food. So we all know we all enjoy the jelly-filled donut. There's a certain symbolism there. But other than the jelly-filled donuts and the menorah, there was a battle that took place. The battle against the Greeks, against the Maccabees, and this battle was won, the few against the many. So this Amnon Denkner challenged the secular Israeli public. He said, just imagine that war was taking place today. The Greeks who stood for culture, entertainment, immorality, a life of no restraint, versus the Maccabees, the Chashmonaim, who stood for a life of devotion, Torah study, Tehillim, self-control. Just imagine that battle was taking place today. Whose side would you be on? Would you want the Greeks to win? Or would you want the Maccabees to win? Would you want the side of entertainment and no restraint to emerge victorious? Or would you be for the side that represents Torah study, devotion, self-control, loyalty to God? A very provocative question. I remember when I read this, actually heard about it, my reaction was, boy, I feel bad for any secular Jew who's got to grapple with that issue. How do I? Who's side? I'm celebrating Hanukkah. I'm celebrating a victory. But in fact, if I was asked right now, I probably would want those who suffered the defeat that they should emerge victoriously because that's really where I'm living my life. That's the direction I'm going. And then I remember I had a very unpleasant second thought, which was, forget everybody else. Who do I want? Who would I want personally to emerge victorious? How much Greek value do I have in myself? How much of my life, which I hopefully is a life of devotion, but how much of my life could use a little bit of brushing up on my devotion? It was a very provocative question. It was a question that annoyed me. I wouldn't say that it ruined my Hanukkah. Maybe it should have. But at least it's food for thought that a person understands what are we celebrating here? What is this really all about? So that was the challenge facing, as a challenge that faces all of us, how much of our life is being lived with that Hashmonoi influence, and how much, what percentage of our life is being lived today with that Greek influence. So we start analyzing the Greeks. The Greeks go and they make decrees against the Jewish people, against Torah, primarily Torah study, but all the other decrees they made. What was really bothering the Greeks? So I'd like to tell you a little story, an incident took place here in Israel. There were two men who were sitting in a hotel lobby here in Israel, somewhere in the north. And they were trying to cut a business deal, and they had a lot of cash on the table, about $10,000 cash. At a certain point, somebody yelled out that there is a suspicious object, what's called in Hebrew, a chefetz chashud. Everybody in Israel, living in Israel, knows that word. Chefetz chashud is a suspicious object. Everybody goes running away till the police sappers come. So he yelled, chefetz chashud. They cleared the hotel lobby. And the two men ran outside. 20 minutes later, the police sappers came. 20 minutes later, they gave the all clear. Everybody went back into the hotel. These two men go back in, and they go over to their table, and sure enough, the $10,000 is missing. Police sappers or no police sappers, $10,000 doesn't last long exposed on a table. So about a week later, there's another man is walking through the hotel, and he goes and he sees there's a flower pot in every hotel lobby. He has a big plant in the lobby, and he sees something green picking, peeking out from under the flower pot. So he pushes this vase, he pushes it back, and sure enough, there's $10,000 cash. What had happened was that one of the foreign workers, as soon as they called the alarm, one of the foreign workers took advantage. He took the money, and he put it underneath the pot, underneath the flower pot, and he, uh, he expected to come back when the lobby clears to be able to recover his money, but the lobby never cleared in the course of a week. There's the money, $10,000, he could not get it. So in comes this Haredi Jew, and he walks in, and he turns back the, this flower pot, pulls out $10,000. So 
What does a Jew do? You find 10,000 dollars, he goes to his local rav, his rabbi, and he asks him, what's the halacha? I just found $10,000 cash, what's the halacha? What's the law? Am I allowed to keep it? Do I have to return it? So the rav said to him, according by the letter of the law, you're allowed to keep the money, the money is yours. Great, guy goes home, $10,000, couldn't fall asleep that night. He realized, look, I'm happy, I'm celebrating, I just made $10,000. But there is some Jew out there who lost $10,000. How could I enjoy it? How could I celebrate if there's a Jew who's lost $10,000? So he goes back to the hotel. He says, I want to see your register. And he checks the register for every guest that the hotel has had for the last week. Goes to the register, and he calls every single person. Did you lose something? No. Did you lose something? No. Did you lose something? No. Did you lose something? Yes. What did you lose? $10,000. I found your money. I'll be right over. Gets in his car. He drives over to the guy's house. He comes in. He says, listen. I found your 10000 The guy says, how could I ever repay? This is unbelievable. I can't believe you gave me. He said, yes, I found your money. I even spoke to Allahic authority. He said, I'm allowed to keep it, but I know that you'd be upset, and therefore I'm giving it back to you. The guy says, one second, what did the Allahic authority say? He said that really technically the money is mine. I could keep it, but I know, you know, we both know it's yours. He says, one second, I don't go for technicality. He said, the money is yours? Yes. I don't accept gifts. I want you to keep the money. I'm not taking the money back. He says, one second, gift schmift. We all know the money is yours. Like, I, technically, halachically, it's mine. He says, I don't want the money back. He says, well, I, you know, I'm not going to keep it because we all know it's yours. He says, so do you have a son? He says, yeah. Where is he? He's in my car. How old is he? He's 23. Well, I have a daughter who's 20. The two of them met. They got engaged. They gave them the money. Everybody lived happily ever after. They probably had a fight at the wedding over the money, but other than that, they all lived happily ever after. Stop and think, how does a person do that? Man found $10,000. Somebody try me. $10,000? And the guy calls. And he goes to try to return it. You know where that comes from? That kind of loyalty, that kind of concern for another Jew, that comes from the Torah. A person who's involved in Torah study absorbs values and is willing to go even beyond the letter of the law. Technically, maybe I could keep it. But is that what the Torah really wants from me? That's what the Greeks were bothered by. The entire effort to shut down the pursuit of Torah is the effort that anti-Semites throughout history have made against the Jewish people. Why are they picking on us constantly? Why are they so bothered by us? The answer is we, with our refinement, which only comes through Torah, through our refinement, we represent their conscience. And they can't bear the fact of watching one nation that rises to such a spiritual level, that achieves such a spiritual plateau, and they know that the power source for the Jewish people is simply the Torah, the Torah that we study, the Torah that we observe. Absorb. That's what the Greeks are trying to, sh sh to shut down. I was once walking in my neighborhood. It was a boiling hot Friday afternoon. My wife asked me to take the garbage. I'm out. If you've been to Israel, they have these huge green garbage dumpsters by every corner. They even call them in Hebrew the Tzfardim, which are frogs, because they look like big green frogs. When I got to the garbage dumpster, I noticed a neighbor of mine, a Haredi neighbor from across the street, and he was up and in, reaching for something in the garbage pail, in the garbage dumpster. So as I got there, obviously I said to him, do, do you need help getting in? Uh, he didn't appreciate the wit. <laughs> and I watched him, and he reached, and he pulled out a carton, an empty cardboard box. He took the box, he crushed it up, and he threw it back into the garbage bin. And then he jumped up again, and again he reached for another cardboard box. He pulled it, crushed it up, and he threw it back in. Now far be it for me to judge anybody's hobbies, I never seen this before. I never saw people fishing for empty cardboard box cartons. And at a certain point, I said to him, what are you doing? So he turned to me, and I'll never forget the look on his face. He said to me, well, maybe you haven't heard. On Motzei Shabbos, on Saturday night, there's going to be a municipal strike. I want to make sure when the municipal strike happens, they're not going to collect the garbage. I want to make sure there's going to be enough room in the, major, in the main dumpsters that none of the neighbors on the block should be inconvenienced when they want to throw out their garbage. That's what Torah does to a person. Torah turns a person into a different type of human being. And that's what was troubling the Greeks. That's what was bothering them. When Hanukkah comes around, one of the messages, lighting that flame, rekindling the flame, we all know that Torah is a fire. Torah is called the white flyer and black fire. We want to rekindle the flame of Torah devotion. There is an angel, a sar, a spiritual being, so to speak, the ministering angel. You've all heard of the angel Gabriel. 
the angel Michael, the angel Raphael, each one has a realm. Raphael is in charge of curing, and Gavriel is in charge of certain, carrying out certain strict judgment. There's a Tsar of Torah, and that Tsar of Torah is called Yophiel, the beauty of God, Yophiel. The Greeks represent beauty and culture, but it's a beauty and a culture, it's the antithesis of a Torah life. Our beauty in our culture is the Torah. The Torah is Yophiel, the Tsar of Torah, the ministering angel is the angel Yophiel. That's our goal on Hanukkah, to try to strengthen our commitment to Torah, whether it involves studying Torah, going to a shir, going to a class, learning with a chavrusa, learning with a study partner. That's our goal on Hanukkah. And finally, one of the things that people grapple with most on Hanukkah, how do you greet each other? We know that in Rosh Hashanah, we say, Shana Tova. And on Pesach, we say, Chag Kosher, Kosher V'Sameach, Yav Kosher Pesach. And Purim, we say, Afrelech Purim, you should have a happy Purim. What is the traditional greeting for the Jews on Hanukkah? People say, Afrelech Hanukkah. According to our tradition, it's really, Afrelech goes with Purim. The traditional greeting for Jews on Hanukkah has always been, Alichtige Hanukkah. You should have a lit up, an enlightened Hanukkah that it should be lit up with Torah, lit up with commitment, lit up with devotion, the opposite of what the Greeks were trying to stamp out. Therefore, we wish everybody to have a Lichtige Hanukkah.